This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today I'll be joined by the host of Bible Discovery TV, Rod Hembry. I want to find out what scriptures cause this lifelong Bible scholar the most trouble. Then, millennials and Gen Z are the first generations to grow up in a post-Christian culture. I'll speak with a pastor who believes these young people could be the spark for the greatest revival ever. But first, Rebecca McLaughlin has a PhD in pastoral studies from Cambridge University and is the author of this book, Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. I want to find out her viewpoint on the idea that Christianity is pegged for being intolerant of diversity by many people today. Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. The author is Rebecca McLaughlin. I, I keep looking at the contents of this book and I'm just amazed at some of the stuff that you, uh, you've packed in here. It's, it's not a light Saturday evening read. It, you you <laughs> want to get into this book and, and, and study. But uh, one that's really facing the church right now and fa well, facing our, our Western culture, uh, chapter two, doesn't Christianity crush diversity? And a lot of people would say yes, that Christianity is very narrow very exclusive and it's a kind of a western only club but that's not really true about christianity is it no pretty much the reverse actually which is is so interesting and quite challenging to uh, our secular friends but also honestly quite challenging to some um, christian folk in this country mm -hmm. we have bought into this idea that diversity is a kind of secular liberal label that christians should be a little bit leery of or um, you know, as anxious about mm -hmm. in fact christianity is the greatest movement for diversity in all of history so we see this from the first jesus in his own ministry continually cut across racial and cultural boundaries so for example the mm -hmm. parable of the good samaritan where he's talking about um he's holding up a a member of a hated racial and religious group as a moral example mm -hmm. or when he's talking with the samaritan woman at the well for instance uh, there are so many instances of jesus himself breaking through those, those paradigms in his, his own ministry. And then he commands his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. And we see the first African convert to Christianity in the book of Acts. Sure. So people often imagine that uh, Christianity came to Africa in the colonial era somehow from sort of white Western missionaries. Actually, Christianity came to Africa likely in the, the first century um, through the Ethiopian eunuch in, in the book of Acts. Um, and uh, it's extraordinary even when you look at uh, how things worked at Pentecost when uh, the Holy Spirit came on on the apostles and they were speaking in languages that everybody who was listening to them could understand. And if you look at the the people groups who are represented in that crowd, um, it's, it's a whole lot of people groups that we may not initially associate with Christianity. Uh, so from the very first, Christianity was a movement that insisted on racial diversity and cultural diversity. But as you say, it was, it was an exclusive message of Jesus's lordship over every tribe and tongue and nation. We see that in the book of Revelation, that one day people from every tribe and tongue and nation will be worshiping Jesus together. So we are a movement of diversity. And in fact, kind of very much almost invented that idea. Christianity uh, brought that idea to the world. We, we have a tendency to think that Christianity is a Western religion. And I don't know whether we've fomented that idea of whether the, the rest of the world has said that because we sent out so many missionaries. I mean, there's thousands of missionaries went out from the, re, the UK back in the 17, 18, in the 1800s, early 1900s, and we think of it as a Western religion, but it, it didn't even start here. <laughs> it's... Yeah, so as you say, it didn't start, it didn't start in the West. Um, Christianity came to Africa, you know, almost 2000, uh, a thousand years before it came to America, more than. Mm -hmm. um, before it ever came, you know, before St. Patrick ever went to Ireland, we have the, the gospel going to Ethiopia. We have Ethiopia becoming one of the first Christian states in the world in the second century. So, as you say, absolutely not how it began. There was certainly a period where Christianity uh, monopolized Western culture, particularly, you know, European and, and then later uh, American culture. And that there is a lot of a, a lot of those cultures that uh, have been in various ways shaped by Christianity. But today, uh, Christianity is the most diverse global belief system with the, the, the most even spread between different cultures and places. And it's very interesting, you talk about missionary activity today. Um, so uh, as, as I understand it, right now, America sends out more missionaries than any other country. Mm -hmm. the, second the second country to send out the most missionaries is South Korea. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny country population-wise yeah. compared to America, but the second largest number of missionaries sent out across the world. And actually the majority of Christians today are people of color 
And increasingly, the majority of evangelists are, are people of color. And there are missionaries now coming from the two thirds world back into the West because it, sure. the secularizing demographic today is people like you, Bob. It's white Western men mm -hmm. um, who are becoming less religious. The rest of the world is not at all. It, it, it's amazed me that uh, maybe some of the, the opposition to what we say is diversity uh, comes out of fear sometimes. We think that we are mm -hmm. a Western religion and like you say, it could be a white male Western religion. But I, I remember the, the number of uh, uh, missionaries coming out of the UK, thousands of them. Now they take in more imams and Muslim missionaries, Muslim religious people than what they send out as far as Christian uh, missionaries. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's a, a fear factor in that, that they feel that somehow Western Christianity is being overwhelmed? Yeah, I think I mean, bringing that, that a similar conversation there back, back to the US, I think there is this perception that immigration to the US is eroding America's Christian identity. Mm -hmm. In fact, the absolute reverse is happening. Uh, immigration, particularly of people of color, not, not people like me, like white Western immigrants like me are not what you want in America. What you want is um, people of color, you, you, you want the African and the Asian um, immigrants uh, mm -hmm. to coming to America to, to give, frankly, a blood transfusion to the American church. That's, that's what's happening um, in the, the city adjacent to mine here in Cambridge. Gives English is the third most commonly spoken language in evangelical churches. Um, which sort of gives you some perspective yeah. on, on how, you know, these incredibly vibrant um, first-generation immigrant churches are springing up all over America. And when we think about the question of, of Muslims immigrating, whether it's to, to the U.S. or the U.K., um, I, I understand that people have, can have some anxiety over that. I actually think that's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if we are called to make disciples of um, folks from, from every nation, and we are called, um, you know, to witness for Jesus to... Uh, Muslims as well as uh, folks from any other religious background, then it's great news for us if they're coming to our hometown, right? Uh, it, it saves it saves you and me the trouble of going to, uh, you know, potentially going to a country that's majority Muslim if we can have um, Muslims to witness to in our own backyard. And so I think there's a real opportunity um, when it's immigration of, of Muslims or Hindus um, or, uh, you know, Buddhists from other, other places. It gives us more, more gospel opportunities. How, how do we separate the, the, uh, the fear caused by things like 9-11 and the fear caused by terrorist attacks around? How do we separate that radical Islam fear out of mm -hmm. our, our immigration policy and out of the uh, illegal immigrant policy? How do we say, mm -hmm. okay, we want to be diverse, but we want to somehow we want to we want to be safe? Yeah, yeah. Well, so this is an interesting question for Christians, and I'm going to slightly broaden that out um, rather mm -hmm. than commenting on particular policy questions. The idea that Christians have the right to safety is, I don't see that anywhere in the scriptures. Like, show me the verse in the New Testament which says Christians have the right to safety. In fact, we are called, anyone who follows Jesus is called to deny, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Jesus. It is a path to a judicial execution by your government to be a Christian in, in, in the first century. And we see most of the apostles giving their lives as martyrs for, for the faith. So the, the idea that we are entitled to safety of any kind as Christians and that we should prioritize safety over gospel opportunities mm -hmm. is utterly against the scriptures. Now, as I say, I'm not wanting to comment on any like particular um, you know, policy questions. I know that these questions are always highly complicated and particularly as an outsider to America, even though I've lived here for nearly 12 years, I'm not saying I'm a policy expert, but I think in principle, if we are motivated by a desire for our own safety above gospel opportunities, we need to get back and read our scriptures. So really, we, we, you're, you're saying that we, we don't want to keep this, this white Western religion. It's not Christianity. It's, we, we need to, it needs to be diversified. Right, and it's, and it's, it's happening. Like the, praise God. The vision that we have in Revelation of people of every tribe and tongue and nation worshiping Jesus together is something I get to experience on a Sunday at my local church. And I know that's not the case, you know, clearly there, I, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has more um, you know, racial and cultural diversity than, than some other places in the US. But if, if any of us have that opportunity, that is, that is a foretaste of heaven that we're getting. Rebecca McLaughlin will join us again in upcoming episodes as she brings us insight into many common questions people have about the Bible. One person who's no stranger to the Bible is Rod Hembry. He's host of Bible Discovery TV. Rod and his family have hosted this popular TV show that walks viewers through the scriptures. But has this Bible scholar himself had any scriptures that have stumped him? That's what I wanted to find out. Rod Hembry has been surrounded by pastors his whole life came to Christ at 14, something like I, that? I did, I did. And but had been in church all your life, been involved in Christian television now since, 
We won't tell anybody how old you are, <laughs> but a long time. Since I was 14. Yeah. And been through the Bible, would you tell me, 30 times? Yes, my 30th time through the Bible, yes. And do it every year on television. What's Rod Henry's toughest scripture? To get your own heart and mind and your faith around it. Say, I'm, I'm, this, this scripture gives me trouble, and I'm going to keep reading it until I really understand what God's saying to me, because I don't like it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because uh, I, you know when when I we're getting personal here. Yeah, that, that's good. But when I when I was uh, young and uh, I had all the pastors around me, my grandfathers on both sides, Whoa. and my uncles both sides. That's tough on both grandfathers. Yeah, it's bad, man. Yeah. My great grandfathers too. I mean, oh, it's man. crazy. Anyway. Um, and my dad was a pastor, and my uncles were pastors, and everybody was a pastor. So you should you believe know. every bit of this without, exactly. any, without any question. <laughs> a fifth generation Christian yeah. should have no problem. But I, I was somebody who knew the best sermons, and I knew how to get saved. But I didn't believe it. And I was doing interesting things on my other side of my life. You know, I was a young kid and I learned to run with a group of people. We were smashing bus windows and doing different things and getting in trouble and doing things. And I would allow my friends to get in trouble and be over here, you know, and chased by the police several times and all of that. And uh, Dave Yanatone, who was a youth pastor, he said to me, well, you know, Rod, um, I think we're going to know we won't do it. We won't talk to you about it. And I, and I was competitive. So I said, what do you mean you won't talk to me about it? I mean, my dad's your boss. I mean, what? come on. <laughs> I'm a 14-year-old yeah. kid. I'm a little arrogant. But you, yeah. Anyway, so um, he said, no, you couldn't handle it. And, and that really bugged Ooh. me. So I said, I can handle it. What is it? He said, a discipleship class. I said, no problem. Mm. I can do a discipleship yeah, class. So it turns out okay, that uh, it was Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. And when you're going yeah, to school, tough. Saturday morning at 7 o'clock, it's not good. But I went. I said, okay, it's only 26, you know, 26 uh, weeks, so I'll do it. The first day we were there, he said, on day one of the month, read Proverbs 1 and Psalms 1. Mm -hmm. Day two, read Proverbs 2 and Psalms 2. Day three, read Proverbs 3 and Psalms 3 and so on. So I got to 21. I got to yep. chapter 21. And I read the first part of Psalms. I have a hole in my soul and I recognized it. I didn't know mm -hmm. God. I really didn't. But that's that chapter. For some reason, on that day, that chapter that light really on and nailed me. And I read, I said, the Lord, the King, finds joy in your strength. How greatly he rejoices in your victory. You have given him his heart's desire. You have not denied the request of his lips. And I remember thinking, my heart's desire, my heart's desire. And I knew that I had a problem. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to talk to God. So I turned around on the couch. Nobody's in the room. It's before school. I said, Lord, I'm a preacher's kid, and I don't even know how to talk to you. Help me. And the Holy Spirit came at that moment and filled my heart. I started bawling like a baby. And I asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness of my sins. I asked Jesus Christ to take my life and make it what he wants it to be. He totally changed me. And I remember being excited. But then as I read on, I remember thinking, well, you know, because I was with a group mm -hmm. you know, that did the bad things. And I remember thinking, you know, that's not good. And I need to talk to my friends about this. I'm carrying my Bible to school now. And I lost 21 Bibles that year because my <laughs> friends tore them up. But anyway, I said, um, I read this. Your hand will capture all your enemies. Your right hand will seize those who hate you. You will make them burn like a fiery furnace. When you appear, the Lord will engulf them in his wrath. Whoa. And I thought, that's a serious verse. Yes. And I looked for my friends and I thought, you know what? God's going to get them. God's going to get them. And he never did. Mm -hmm. God never got them. So I thought, they got away with it. They got worse and worse and worse. One friend got away with unbelievable stuff. And that really bothered me. Because I read that. And, and we're down here at, at 21.8, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. We're just exactly right. And I said, Lord... Come on, Come you, on. <laughs> you got to do this, <laughs> got to do this, got to do it, you know. And it wasn't until I was uh, 48 
that um, I ended up calling one of my friends. And I was still troubled by this verse, but I just trusted, okay, God will get him sometime. I, I, God will do something, you know, I don't know. But I'm trusting the Lord. And you had prayed, you, you prayed this over them. Yeah, I said, Lord, you got to get them. You got to get them. You got to, you got to get them. And um, it turns out that God did. God called them, and He called them through me. Mm -hmm. He used me because I called my friend. I said, "How are you doing?" He said, "I'm fine. I've got some problems and this and that and the other." He was living in Florida at the time, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, "You need to tell him about who I am, and tell him about me." Now, did this guy know that you were a believer? He did, mm -hmm. but he had told me he's. Don't I do my me. truth, and he does his truth, and away they go, yeah. you know. And I said, "You know what, Dave? Jesus Christ died for you. Do you go to church?" And do you know what he did? He started crying. I was the one that I had to fulfill that because God had spoken that to me. God will do that if I do my part. Mm -hmm. And that struck me. And I was like, Oh, man, Lord, I didn't understand. Yeah. It's a matter of understanding your word. I didn't get that till years later. You know, 28 years later, I'm getting it. <laughs> like, what happened, Lord, 24 <laughs> years later? And God said to me, spoke to my heart, people don't understand me because they read the Bible and they're just like, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you need to meditate. You need to understand what God says because he speaks to Take me. Take that deep in your heart. So God speaks to you when you read the Bible. Now, there, there's people out there right now that said, well, I've, I've heard about the Bible. I've seen some things. I've read some things. I don't like it. What do you think is the toughest verse for a non-believer to grab a hold of to become a believer? Really? Yeah. These days? Mm -hmm. John, what, what, what keeps them away? I'll tell you what keeps them away. Uh, because I see it in, in, in today's environment with the political correctness and mm -hmm. all everything going on. Yep. And uh, everything going on related to what God does and what he doesn't do. We actually think that God cares about a lot of things that we do. And uh, we need to understand God cares, but he doesn't consider that, okay? It's not important in his time scale and his, his realm. Of course it's not. You know, and, and God, Nicodemus is a guy who's from the mm -hmm. Pharisees. The Pharisees probably came about during the exile. But anyway, the Pharisees were interesting guys. And he comes to Jesus Christ at night. Mm-hmm. And he says to him, I, I got to come to you at night because I don't, you know, I don't know <laughs> yeah. about being, I don't want to share too much space with you in the daytime. He comes to him at night and he says, tell me, how do I have eternal life? Because they believed in the resurrection mm -hmm. and the, fair, the Sadducees mm -hmm. did not. That's why they were sad, you see. Of course, they were sad. In chapter 3, verse 16, God says, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. Now that's good, but a lot of people stop there. Mm -hmm. But keep reading. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world mm -hmm. through him. The world is on a downward spiral. Yeah. Spiral. It's going down. And they think they can save themselves. They think they can save themselves. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Yeah. This is Jesus speaking. Mm -hmm. Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And people say, you are too narrow-minded. That's what the Bible says. Yes. And they, I believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love darkness. Mm -hmm. See, read the rest of the verse. Sure. Read the whole thing. Rather than the light because of their deeds, they were evil. For everyone who hates or who does evil hates. Okay, so wait a minute. You're talking about hate. We're making laws mm -hmm. about hate. Up in Canada, yeah. we got this law about hate, you know. Yeah. But wait a minute, how do we define our morality? How do we do that? Sure, that's all changed. It's all changed. Mm -hmm. We don't define our morality by the way we think. We define our morality by who we serve. Right. So if we serve Jesus Christ, the supreme God who made the heavens and the earth mm -hmm. and everything in it, that according to the Bible, then we understand 
Then we see the kingdom of God. Then we get it. John 3 would be the hardest yeah. chapter for anyone to believe. Okay. There's somebody out there right now that's arguing with you about that, saying you are too narrow-minded. There can't be just one way. There can't be just Jesus Christ and that's it. But at the same time, they're feeling like your friend did. They know they're lost. They know it's a downward spiral. They know they have no way out. Would you pray for them right now? They're, they're struggling with I this. would. They're In struggling fact, with if it. you're struggling, if you're a person who is struggling with this, understand that I didn't say it. This is the Word of God. This is the Bible. Jesus Christ cares for you. Jesus Christ loves you. And if you confess your, your heart and realize that you don't have what it takes to overcome, you don't have what it takes to do all the good things you want to do, but if you confess to Jesus that you're a sinner, but He came, paid the cost of sin to free you, and invite Him into your life to be Lord, and I'm going to pray with you right now, invite Him into your life to be Lord, then you know what? Your life will change. Pray this prayer and say, Father, in your name I come to you, and I believe that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross for the cost of sin, and rose again miraculously. And I believe that he's given me eternal life if I accept him as Lord of my life. Be the Lord of my life. I need your help right now. Help me, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen and amen. Amen. And I believe there's, there's people there right now that have just done that. They struggled with it, they struggled with it, they struggled with it, and they think it's a narrow way, but finally they see, I can get through that narrow way, I can come to that narrow way, but my life's going to change, and their life is going to change, and they've got to realize that. But Absolutely. Thank you so much, brother. You're welcome, It's been brother. great. It has been great. Great. This next generation is being called by most as America's first post-Christian generation, a generation where God and church is not a priority or an expectation. Despite all the stories of suicide, gender confusion, and a lack of morals, my next guest believes that this could be the generation that changes everything back to God. Matt Rice is a pastor in Columbus, Ohio, and his passion for youth ministry goes back to when he was a youth himself. Back in the 90s, you were dealing with millennials. Yes, yes. And now it's Generation Z. That's Generation Z. You're it's my kids' it? generation. Are you losing any hope? No, actually, I think I'm more hopeful. Really? Uh, yet there's, you know, there's... If you listen to some, there's reason to believe the sky's falling. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the statistics on the surface. Are we looking, at, are we looking more at, at church attendance with the Generation Z? Or what are we looking at when you look at on, a, I, I say on the surface? Well, I think when you, uh, you look at some of their departure from what we would consider a uh, Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a new book by James Emery White called Generation Z, which is a great resource. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he makes a statement in that book that uh, this generation is the first post-Christian generation in America. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Generation Z, which will be the most powerful religious force here in a few years, uh, has departed significantly in many ways, uh, whether it's sexuality, marriage, uh, some of those things, biblical authority. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's reasons to believe that you know, we've got our work cut out for us. Right. Uh, but I think at the same time, God said, in, in the scripture, when sin abounds, grace does yet more abound. There's still the promise in the last days, yeah. I will pour out my spirit. So they're, they're not, they're not uh, non-spiritual. They're still very, very interested in spiritual things, but yeah. maybe not the traditional we think is, is the Christian. Yeah, and, and then there's, there's a, another group called the nuns, which mm -hmm. is kind of this, yeah. uh, he wrote another book on the rise of the nuns, and people were talking about this. These are the religiously unaffiliated. Uh, which is now the fastest growing segment yeah, they, of Christianity they, in America. They don't really care about God at all. They're, they're more apathetic. Yeah, they're just not looking. Yeah. They're, they're not against it. They're not hostile. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just not interested. But, they're, yeah. but they, can be, they, they can be the people that we're after. I they're think, the lost. yes, I think in many ways um, <clears throat> what this has put us in a position is, is you have a generation that is free from some of the trappings of religion. Mm -hmm. um, that sometimes make it hard to have a true revival. And so I think we're positioned uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit um, to see God do a sweeping move of His Spirit in this generation uh, that will eclipse any generation previous in America. What do you think would ignite that? Mm -hmm. uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. These, these are, the, these are the, the kids that are uh, basically from kindergarten to yeah. college now. Yeah, yeah. 
Would they recognize that? I've taken, we took young people to nations. We saw young people lay hands on and pray for people and miracles occur. Mm -hmm. We saw a, a girl come forward in a crusade in Mexico who couldn't, her, she couldn't walk. Her mom was bringing her, she couldn't walk. I saw 14 and 15 year old young people we prayed for uh, to, to pray for others. They prayed for her. This little girl's foot straightened up on her way back to the seat. The mother came back onto the platform, weeping and crying. I saw her put her down. She walked across that platform for the first time in her life. And I looked over to the 14 and 15 year old uh, girls that had come with us on the trip and they're weeping and they're crying. And I knew they would never be the same. Mm -hmm. So I've been a, mm -hmm. a believer. If we can have that kind of outpouring, I don't care uh, what types of things we see in this culture that stand against uh, the worldview, the uh, alternate worldview, the, the evil in media, all of those things can be moved back by a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I believe is the greatest hope, and you that's what we're going to see. Anything that we're seeing right now that's holding that back from this generation? Uh, prayerlessness of God's people. Uh, it, it's never the world's fault that a revival hasn't come. It's that always a, the church's great, fault. Great point. Yeah. yeah. It's the consecration and the prayers of God's people. God said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. Has the church given up on Generation Z? I mean, I don't want to talk about the church in general. I mean, yeah. I don't want to cast them all into this, this thing, but have people in the church given up on this generation because of what they've heard in the, in the media, what they've heard in, in newspapers and social media, they've given up on them and we're not praying for them or not praying for revival yeah. in, the, in that group? I, I think many have, but I think there is a growing, hungry remnant mm -hmm. of people that are praying and seeking God and determined to pray for a move of God that will sweep this generation. And I'm seeing at least, uh, we've done conferences for years. In the last two years, some of the most powerful moves of the Holy Spirit I've seen among 13-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 17-year-olds. You just get them in the presence of God. If they can get an encounter, there will be an exchange of His life for theirs and a hunger to reach their world. Well, getting them in the presence of God, are we as a, uh, individuals or parents or church putting any other stumbling blocks in their way to get there? Or is it the, is basically the culture? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I tend to think that if, if the church can, and our, this is our generation, it's mm -hmm. on our generation, um, yeah. if we get on fire for God, uh, then that's the greatest gift we can give to a generation coming up. And then to pray for them and believe uh, for them and what God has in their life, I think that's gonna spark a movement. The purpose of Viewpoint is to discuss the many questions people have about the Bible and how we can find answers for today's difficult problems. And we appreciate the amazing response we've had on this show, including being recognized by International Christian Film and Music Festival as the best TV show. Viewpoint is produced totally from the financial gifts of viewers like you. So we'd appreciate you continuing to support this show by making a donation to WTLW.com. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next week on Viewpoint. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. <laughs>